not you believe in ghosts, the serendipitous parallels that exist between the Indiana City Brewery and the historic home brewing company seem to extend beyond space and time. Did the spirits of the former home brewing company call to its current owner from beyond the grave? I'll let you decide in this episode of Drinking With Beers. Before we interview Ray Kamstra, who is the current owner and founder of Indiana City Brewery, and who I'm pretty sure is someone from the historic home brewing company reincarnated, let me give you a brief history on the home brewing company and you'll see what I mean. The parallels are almost creepy. The home brewing company formed over 100 years ago in 1891 as an act of rebellion against the British. There was a huge amount of foreign investment capital pouring into the United States at the time, and British syndicates were buying up a bunch of breweries. Brewing was a big business back then and a huge part of the economy, so naturally the idea of all of these British-owned breweries in America became a source of contention and public controversy. Some people were all for it, happy to take the money, because they believed that it would help build a country that was still in its infancy and solidify peaceful relations between the US and Britain. Others, however, became very anxious because they felt like it gave the British too much control and that it would eventually prove disastrous which is maybe understandable considering the history between the two. So foreign investors eventually made their way to Indianapolis and a British syndicate bought a considerable share of three of Indianapolis's largest breweries, the Schmidt, Lieber, and Mouse breweries for $2 million, which I know doesn't sound like a lot, but back then it was. That would be the equivalent of over $56 million today and merged the three breweries to form the Indianapolis Brewing Company. Well, again, most people were all for this. In fact, some even thought that it would mean cheaper beer, but others, not so much. They did not like it at all. They hated it. In fact, they hated it so much that they got all fired up and in their rage against this idea that the British could now control a large portion of the local economy, gathered together a group of 90 stakeholders and together they raised $200,000, which would be the equivalent of 5 million today, because they valued supporting local business. They wanted to keep the brewing industry in the hands of the community. And so the home brewing company was born. And while the 5 million equivalent in startup capital couldn't hold a candle to the behemoth 56 million that was now the Indianapolis Brewing Company, this group of underdog heroes sparked a rebellion and many saloon owners refused to purchase from these British syndicate breweries. And together, they made small dent. Hey, if anything, they were making a statement. But then prohibition happened and none of this even mattered. So the home brewing company closed its doors in 1917, just before Indiana entered into prohibition, but not before making one last final statement via a very strongly worded letter. The letter reads as follows. The day will dawn again in Indiana when a man can drink what he wants, when personal liberty will again be a citizen's right. So fast forward to 2013, when Ray Camstra opened Indiana City Brewery in the old home brewing company's bottling plant. And this wasn't on purpose. He didn't even know the history of the building. At the time, the craft beer scene was still beginning to emerge in Indianapolis, giving residents the opportunity to drink what they want because of the variety of options that were now available through craft beer. Whereas before, all that was really available were those big beer lagers. And there are other parallels. First of all, the fact that Indiana City Brewery opened in the home brewing company's bottling plant. But what's interesting is, is that Ray didn't even know the history of the building until after the fact. Second, Ray started out as a home brewer during a time when people began to value locally brewed beer. Number three. Indiana City Brewery was made possible in part by crowdsourcing via a Kickstarter campaign, which is very similar to the way the home brewing company formed with the help of shareholders. Then there's the fact it's called Indiana City, whose connotation has roots in the idea of locally brewed beer with emphasis placed on community. So it seems that the Indiana City Brewery and the home brewing company have similar values. And if the name isn't enough, the logo that Ray designed for the brewery is very similar to the logo of the home brewing company. Now keep in mind that Ray knew nothing about the home brewing company the time he was designing the logo. I mean, is this just a case of great minds think alike? Does it all just boil down to coincidence? I mean, certainly there must be some reasonable explanation for all of this. 
But then, there's been reports of supernatural activity within the brewery. And on two separate occasions by two different ghost hunting organizations, they've both reported a ghost named Albert. Could it be the ghost of Albert Lieber, of the Lieber Brewing Company, who was the first managing director and president of the Indianapolis Brewing Company? I mean, just how much bad blood was there between these two companies? Whether or not you believe in ghosts, the parallels that exist between the past and the present that connect the home brewing company with the Indiana City Brewery are undeniable. I mean, but seriously, it's almost as if a force from beyond the graves at work here. Is Indiana City Brewery really the home brewing company back to fulfill unfinished business? I'll let you decide after you hear Ray's story. Ray Kamstra, I'm the founder of Indiana City Brewing Company. So back in 2012, I was looking for the great home for Indiana City Brewing Company. Just started looking at industrial sites all over the place. Nothing was really calling to me. I saw there's a tire shop that was available for rent on Washington and Shelby Street. It really called to me because it's a, like a plug and play brewery. You know, it's like floor drains, tall ceilings, a loft for grain. It's got the high voltage electricity. It's had compression, air compression, it had everything I needed uh, to get started as a small nano, nano brewery. But unfortunately, it was just way out of our price range. The building we're in is directly across the street from that tire shop. I literally turned around and saw a for sale sign in front of the building. We weren't in a position to really buy the building and I met with the owner and he said he'd been trying to sell it for just over five years and he would definitely entertain a leasing option. So that's what really got us into the building. And it was. Uh, meant to be. I mean, the second I walked in here, all the, the high ceilings, the uh, wood rafters, the, the steel, the, the columns, the exposed brick, the concrete, it's everything that you, you want for a local brewery. It just works. The vibe really works with craft beer, and it was the best thing that ever happened. We found out about the history when I approached the building owner, and he asked what we were going to use it for, and I told him the brewery, and he that you won't believe it, but this used to be a brewery. This was the bottling house for the home brewing company, which they were a, a German style lager brewery here pre-prohibition era. So they packaged all the beer that they brewed, the home brewing company brewed in bottles in this building. So it has a lot of beer history. Yeah, it seems like it's meant to be. We're not trying to recreate the home brewing company by any means, but it's really cool to have that history makes it feel like we belong. Well, we were doing our Kickstarter campaign when we found the building and we found out all the history of the building and I really think that that was a big reason why we were so successful. Obviously we spent a lot of time working on the campaign. I was working on it day and night uh, to pull it off. We raised $35,000 in 30 days all crowdfunded which was a, a fun experience. It was a really exciting experience for me. We have all this local support right out of the gate. But we announced the history of the building in the middle of that. And it really got people, I think, to look a little harder and see what's happening here. It was, it was really cool to see that kind of support. It was abandoned for quite a long time. There was no electricity. There was no plumbing. Every window, every door was boarded up. There was a pretty intense like barbed wire fence all around the property. Overgrown lot pretty much is all it was. Uh, it's been totally abandoned, so there's a lot of work to do. And we did most of it ourselves, aside from what we can't do ourselves, like electric electric and plumbing and all that. But we've built out all, framed out all the walls and we opened up all the doors, all the windows. We redid all the windows because uh, they were all broken out and boarded up. So that was about a six month, uh, a seven month project just uh, getting the space to where we could move into it. So the name Indiana City is the literal definition of Indianapolis. It's Indianapolis, Indiana City. But looking back at Indianapolis and the city it had grown into, I was really proud of, you know, and moving back here and being a part of this Indiana City. So that's really why, where the name came from. I designed the Torch logo uh, back in the summer of 2012. It was a little different as far as like, it had a handle with some star, a star and stuff like that, but the, the basic torch emblem that we use, um, I designed that back in the summer of 2012. And then we moved into the building, November of 2012, and then 
you know, they're doing the build out and the story and start bringing us things. And we see that the icon for the home brewing company was a torch, which was just bizarre. I, <laughs> I don't know what was going on, but it's like some things are just meant to be, it feels like, you know. Um, the torch, obviously, the reasoning for it, it's the torch on the Sailors and Soldiers Monument, Lady Victory is holding up in the dead center of town, you know. So that's really where the idea came from. But to find out that the home brewing company also used the torch, it's not just they use the torch, the flames are blowing in the same direction as what we have on ours. <laughs> so it's just really interesting to see that stuff. And, you know, is it just coincidental or was it meant to be? We've got a quote from the home brewing company that we keep in the tap room hanging up on the wall. And that quote comes from a letter that they sent to all of their customers. They did home delivery and they did, you know, obviously supplying beer to bars and restaurants, but in addition, they did home delivery. So they sent this letter out to all of their customers and prohibition was signed into law. And basically to sum up the quote, it's, you know, the day will dawn again where a man can drink what he wants. And it's just really chilling to read that quote on that letter, you know, that someone had brought into us. And just to know that we brought beer back to the building. I don't get too much into the supernatural myself, but we've all had unique experiences here. We've had people just feeling a, a rush past them, like a breeze past them real quick. You know, like something just ran past. And weird stuff. I've had experiences on the second floor. It's totally abandoned. It's just dirty, dusty. But there were some markings on the floor that I've wiped clean that reemerge over and over. And I didn't tell anybody about it for the longest time because I was afraid if I did that they would stop happening. And as soon as I told people about it, it doesn't happen anymore. I'm like, I am not crazy. Uh, there's this weird X with a circle that would be drawn in the dust up there. And I would, I would just take my shoe and wipe it out real quick and go up there to open a window or something and it's back. Like someone's playing a trick on me is what I thought, but it happened three or four times. And our head brewer, he's had a bucket fly across the room for no reason. Sitting on a table, flies up, bounces off the wall and lands down. Like that's not the wind or something falling off of the table, you know? Um, before we even opened, um, we had a guy named Dustin that was helping out in the building build out process. And he kept telling me, he's like, I'm not gonna be at that place after dark anymore because he'd work pretty late hours. And he said, there's just too many things that are happening that are just spooking him and he can't. And I, I just shrugged it off, but come to find out, he's probably, he's probably telling the truth in there. We've actually had ghost hunters in the building a couple different times, different people, different times. And there's apparently a guy named Albert that lives here. I've, I'm a believer. <laughs> I think there's something in here. But it's not evil. There's nothing evil happening. It's just totally like there's a spirit in the, in the building. And you feel its presence at times.